and they use it to create obstacles to make it harder for people to stop. And this is what I call social inertia. It takes many specific forms. For instance, Microsoft pressured computer manufacturers to sign a contract that they would charge for a Windows license even if the user, for, ev for every machine sold, even if the user didn't want Windows. And we're just going to erase it. Now, it ought to be illegal to uh, sign such a contract. It ought to, the contracts ought to be void as a measure to preserve competition. But it's not, for the most part. And so Microsoft gets away with doing this. And since the users are forced to pay the so-called Microsoft tax anyway, uh, one possible motive they would have for not running Windows is taken away. That's why it's social inertia. It's a, a barrier that discourages people from going away from Windows. Another kind of social inertia is the network effect. Any kind of communication system becomes more attractive as there are more people using it because that means more people you could talk to. So Skype is a proprietary program designed to surveil its users, so it's malware. And so I urge people not to use Skype, and I refuse personally to use it. But many people say, I can't resist using Skype. My friends, relatives, colleagues insist that I have to use Skype. Well, that's an example of the network effect. And what it means is that the user, who is first of all, in first place, a victim, is also culpable for pressuring others to use Skype. If you use Skype because your friends, family, or colleagues pressure you to use it, well, guess what? You are now part of the pressure on others not to stop using Skype. So the victims are also co-perpetrators. Victim co-perpetrators. That's what you have when there's a network effect. That's what the users are. The user of any proprietary program is the victim of that program, which takes away her freedom. But in, in the case of, the, of a communication system, in addition to victims, they are also co-perpetrators. They're also partly to blame for pressuring other people to use a malicious, non-free program. So it's extremely, it's, it's your duty to refuse to use Skype. That's what you have to do to avoid being guilty for pressuring other people to use Skype. But in any case, you see the phenomenon of social inertia. Another form of social inertia happens when schools teach people to use Windows and then businesses use Windows. And when you ask the businesses, please stop using Windows, it's uh, an injustice to you. Uh, the executives say, we have to run Windows because that's what people know how to use. That's what schools teach them. And when you ask the people in the schools to stop teaching Windows, they say, we have to teach Windows because that's what businesses use and they want to hire people who know Windows. So each one is waiting for the other to change first. And that's social inertia. It's, it may look impossible to overcome social inertia, but there is a way. It requires some people to have firm will and refuse, even against the pressure. So schools, for instance, they have a duty not to teach windows. So, uh, and likewise not to teach math any proprietary program, it's the same thing. The point is the school has a duty to society because it has a social mission. In addition, when these companies come to campus 
either to sell something or to re recruit workers, people should protest them. They should be met with people with signs and leaflets. Another obstacle is open source. The purpose of the term open source is to avoid raising ethical issues. During the 1990s, as the use of GNU plus Linux was growing, people in the community had different views. Some people supported the free software movement, where we see this as a matter of justice or injustice. But there were others who liked free software. They used it, they contributed it, but they didn't want to talk about it as an ethical issue. And there was a debate between these two camps. When newcomers saw the debate, they would realize there was a free software movement in which people were concerned with freedom as users. But in 1998, some of the people in the other camp coined the term open source so that they could talk about the same software and the same activities without ever raising it as a matter of right or wrong, justice or injustice. They wanted to bury those ideas, and open source was the beginning of their method for burying those ideas. With their new term, they constructed a, a different discourse, one that was based on practical convenience only. If you look around at what open source supporters say, and compare it with what we say in the free software movement, you'll see that it's fundamentally different. Because we raise the issue as a matter of right and wrong, and they avoid that completely. They won't even say anything that would hint at this possibility that proprietary software is wrong. Because their goal was to appeal to business executives, and they figured that discussion, any suggestion that some business practices are unjust makes business executives uncomfortable. They want the state to say if business profits, it's good. They don't want, they want society to tolerate all kinds of business practices no matter what harm they do. You know, in Brazil, they want to be able to chop down the rainforest. They don't want anything in their way. In the software field, they want, they want proprietary software not to be criticized or rebuked. So then there are always those who, because they want to be favored by the businessmen, hush up and never mention the ethical issues. That's what open source does. <clears throat> so their discourse is based only on practical benefits. Where we say, if you develop and release a program, it's your moral duty to let users change it and redistribute it. The open source supporters say, if you develop and release a program, it might Think about whether it's in your private <coughs> interest to let users change and redistribute the program. After all, they might make practical, they might give you practical benefits, like improving the quality of the code. And that might be true, but it's a weak argument because its roots are not deep. You can't support a strong conclusion on an argument with a weak foundation. So that's the weakness that open source brings to our community. Unfortunately, in 98, most of the community held open source type views. And almost all of the businesses in the community uh, adopted, so most users adopted the term open source. Almost all the businesses adopted the term open source. And the politicians and journalists mostly followed the money. And since then, most of the media, the important media, only talk about open source. 
it may be a little better in Brazil, I don't know, because in Portuguese you do have a clearer word. But even in other languages where you have a word like livre, you can see lots of media talking about open source. They do this so much that for the most part the public only hears about open source and only hears the open source ideas. Most of the people that have heard of me think that I'm a supporter of open source, which is false. I never supported that. And that means people have the wrong, they heard of me and they have the wrong idea of what I stand for. So I get messages where people thank me for what I've contributed to open source. Or they want to ask me questions about open source. And all I can say to them is, open source is the slogan of those who reject what I stand for. Too bad. Uh, I've even seen articles that called me the father of open source. <laughs> <laughs> what can I do? I send a letter to the editor saying, if I'm the father of open source, it was conceived through artificial insemination. Which <laughs> is stolen sperm. Without my knowledge or consent. <laughs> Then I present the name and the ideas of the free software movement, and that's the serious point of the letter. But it's always fun to start with a joke. <laughs> and besides, the joke might convince them that it's worth publishing my letter. So, I do a lot of work to teach people that I support software liberty and not open source and teach them what that means. But I can't do it enough, not by myself. There are other free software activists who do this too. We need your help. And the way to help us is simply say software liberty. Don't say open source. Don't say it ever. Why, why do that? Well, of course, your views are up to you. If you agree with the ideas of open source, you're free to say so. But if you think that this is a matter of freedom and you want freedom, well, show people that by saying software livery. And the most important place to do that is in a discussion, say on a mailing list where there are lots of people. If other people are talking about open source, then you say, uh, we should choose software livery because that respects people's freedom. You will educate everybody on that list. And if you, sh if you firmly stick to it, if you refuse to shift to saying open source, then you will show that this is important to you. And even if you don't win on whatever decision they're discussing, you will do good by this. You will have a good effect of educating the other people on the list. Of course, the people who are most firmly in disagreement with you, they won't change their minds. Don't worry about them. You, they're not the ones you're trying to teach. It's everybody else on the list that you're trying to teach. So even if those people stand firm in disagreeing with you, you're still achieving some good. So even if the mask does not inflate, uh, understanding of ethical issues is flowing through the list. So, another obstacle is when the specs of hardware are secret. And this happens all too often uh, for many pieces of hardware. We can't write free software because we don't know the commands to run them. The manufacturers want you to buy the product or it's inside a computer they want you to buy and they refuse to tell you how to use it. They say, here is this non-free driver or firmware program, install it, run it, and shut up. 
oh, we're not going to run this non-free program. What we need is reverse engineering, meaning somebody who's clever has to study how the non-free program controls the hardware and figure out what the commands of the hardware are and pass those to a software developer who will write a free program to do the same job. Now, this is hard work, but it's the only way to fix those problems. It's also a lucrative professional career. There are not very many people who do this, and they have lots of demand for their business. So, this university should teach reverse engineering. Speaking of teaching, all schools should teach free software exclusively, only free software. And when I say schools, I mean all levels, starting from nursery school to the university and also adult education. Any institution whose job is to teach is a school. And this applies to all of them. And when I say teach exclusively free software, I don't just mean formal instruction. Anytime the school needs students to use a particular program and familiarizes the students with that program, that's a way of teaching. And the school should do this exclusively with free software because the school has a social mission. It exists to educate good citizens of a society that is strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free. And in the software field, that means graduating students accustomed to free software and thus ready to be citizens of such a society in digital ways. And this should not be a mysterious, unexplained preference. No, just the, quite the contrary. The school should teach the civic reasons for this policy and how free software is necessary for us to have freedom. And the school should never teach a non-free program because that's implanting dependence. Teaching people to use non-free software is like teaching them to smoke tobacco. <laughs> tobacco, of course, is death. The non-free program may not give you a heart attack, but it is harmful to your society and your life. It subjugates you. But there's also moral education. Education in citizenship. The school should teach its students to be good, helpful, cooperating members of society. It should teach the habit of helping others. Therefore, every class should have this rule. Students, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share copies with the rest of the class, including the source code in case someone wants to learn, because this class is a place where we share our knowledge. Therefore, you may not bring the proprietary software to class unless it's for purposes of doing reverse engineering. The school must follow its own rule in order to set a good example. So the school must bring only free software to class and share copies of the source code with, as well as the executable with everyone in the class, except for reverse engineering exercises because in that case, the source code would reveal the answers to the problem. So the school wouldn't show the source code to the students until after they hand in their work. But there's also education in programming. Every program embodies knowledge. If it's proprietary, it withholds that knowledge from the students. So the proprietary program is the enemy of the spirit of education and should not be tolerated in a school 
except to do reverse engineering, which is the way of extracting the knowledge that the program is trying to withhold from students. But the free program offers its knowledge to the students. It supports the spirit of education, so it's the only software that the, that the school should be using in its education. How do you learn to write good, clear code? You do it by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. But only free software gives you the opportunity to read the code of large programs we really use. Then you have to write lots of code. To learn to write good, clear code for large programs, you have to write lots of code for large programs. But you have to start small. What does it mean to start small writing code for large programs? Writing small programs is not even the beginning to tackle the challenges of large programs. No, starting small in working on large programs means writing small changes in existing large programs. And then you can advance to bigger and bigger changes. Only free software offers the chance to write changes small and then bigger in existing large programs we really use. Any school can offer the opportunity to master the craft of programming if it is a free software school, which it always should be. This university should migrate to free software completely. Of course, that will take some years. It can't be done in a week, which means the university should start taking substantial steps so that it can finish migrating perhaps in 10 years instead of a century. Because often you'll find that they take tiny steps and the kind that if they keep doing it, they'll finish in a century. That's not enough. They have to take bigger steps than that. And if they don't want to do it, it's up to you to pressure the school to do it. Those of you who have a relationship with the school, if your students, teachers, employees, administrators, or parents of students, it's your responsibility to campaign for the school to migrate to free software. Which means, of course, the first step is just to ask. But if that doesn't succeed, then you've got to start organizing, you've got to uh, teach others about the issues so that you can win their support, look for various ways of trying to pressure the institution, and so on. Human rights depend on each other. If we lose one human right, it becomes harder to defend the others. Nowadays, since we use computing for many important activities in life, free software, in other words, having control over our computing, has become one of the essential human rights, essential to defend the other essential human rights. And that sometimes requires a sacrifice. It has always been thus. Freedom sometimes requires a sacrifice. And only those willing to make a sacrifice will continue to have freedom. <clears throat> but some people are not willing to make any practical sacrifice for their freedom. Sometimes I've asked people, you know, to switch to a free program in, to do a certain job and they say this proprietary program is very convenient it has lots of features I'll switch to a free program when you show me a free program that is 100% as powerful and convenient and reliable and fast as this proprietary program what they're really saying is that the uh, amount of sacrifice they will make for freedom is zero because for them the value of freedom is zero and we can't make them change their minds but we can point out the significance of what they're saying what what those words really mean and point them out to others 
as examples of being very foolish. So how do you help our cause? Well, if you're good at programming, write free software. Contribute to free software projects. I suggest that you contribute to free software projects written by others before you try to start one. That way you'll learn how to run your project well, and when you start your own, you'll do a good job. But most people do not have a talent for programming. And if you're not good at it, you won't contribute very much. So maybe you should contribute other kinds of work. For instance, you could become an organizer, an activist. You could become a free software speaker. We need more speakers. That's a really important way to help. Uh, there's a university in Lima where there's a student club where they uh, where they learn to give speeches to teach other people about free software. You could do the same, it's very useful. You could also be an organizer, somebody who helps keep the activist group running by keeping track of the membership list and planning events, inviting people, working out what will happen, telling people when it will be, and so on, making the events happen. You can help persuade schools and governments to move to free software. <coughs> Regarding schools, see gnu.org slash education. Regarding governments, see gnu.org slash government. Governments do their computing for the people. So they have a responsibility to the people to maintain full control of that computing. In other words, a responsibility to do it with free software and never use service as a software substitute. <coughs> if you're good at using the system, you can help other users. That's a very important contribution too. You could start a GNU slash Linux user group. You could participate in an existing GNU slash Linux <coughs> user group. If there's an existing GNU slash user group, GNU slash Linux user group, which calls itself a Linux user group, you can go there and help users and explain to the others why their name is not right and they should change it. And simplest of all, you can say free software or software livre when you're speaking Portuguese. Please do not make the mistake of using the, borrowing the English word free when you're speaking Portuguese. Use the Portuguese word, which is clear and unambiguous. So, uh, just saying software needs, whenever it's pertinent, will help make people aware this is a matter of freedom. And there are other ways to help us that there's no room for in these images, but look at gnu.org slash help, and you'll see a list of including these ways and many other kinds of work that would help us. You can also help us by joining the Free Software Foundation at fsf.org. Or you can join here. Because of the fact that I'm here, you have an opportunity to join and pay your dues in cash. <laughs> For, if you use fsf.org, of course, you have to do some sort of internet payment. Uh, you can also help us by buying the merchandise. Even if you take stickers and you put them up, that's helping. That's why they're here. Um, so, um, uh, at this point, it's time to present my other identity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should just ask, has everybody had a chance to write down name and email address on one of the sheets of paper that were passed around? If it didn't get to you, please raise your hand. Okay, okay so there's some people. Uh, is that if you could get them the, uh, the paper so that... What? Oh, there's someone over there too. Well, 
Maybe there's one sort of beer there. But anyway, now I'll present my other identity. <laughs> if you know anything about this, please don't say it. Uh, everyone will see it in a minute or so. Let them have an opportunity to fully enjoy. <laughs> I am Saint Ignatius of the Church of Emacs. I bless your computer, my child. <laughs> Max started out as an extensible text editor I wrote, which developed into a way of life for many users, as they extended it so much they could do all their computing without ever leaving Emacs. And then it became a church with the launch of the news group alt.religion.emacs. <clears throat> In the church of Emacs, we have a great schism between several versions of Emacs. And we also have saints, but fortunately no gods. Instead of gods, we adore the one true editor, Emacs. <laughs> <laughs> to be a member of the Church of Emacs, you must pronounce the confession of the faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU, and Linux is one of its kernels. <laughs> <laughs> then, if you become a real expert, you can celebrate that with our ceremony, the Fubar Mitzvah, <laughs> in which you chant a portion of our sacred scriptures. That is to say, the system source code. <laughs> We also have the cult of the Virgin of Emacs, which means anyone who has never known or used Emacs. And in the Church of Emacs, offering the opportunity to lose Emacs virginity is considered a blessed act. <laughs> we also have the Emacs pilgrimage, which consists of invoking all the commands of Emacs in alphabetical order. <laughs> there is a breakaway Tibetan sect which claims that it's sufficient to execute, to invoke them automatically under the control of a script. And they do that repetitively thousands of times. But the Mother Church holds that to gain spiritual merit, you must type them by hand. <laughs> the Church of Emacs has certain advantages compared with others I won't name. <laughs> to be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy. <laughs> but it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exorcise whatever evil proprietary operating systems have possessed computers under your control or set up for your regular use, and then install a wholly free operating system, where wholly can be spelled in more than one way, and then use and install exclusively free software with and on the system. If you make that vow and you live by it, then you too will be a saint, and you'll have the right to wear a halo if you can find one, because they don't make them anymore. <laughs> There's a traditional rivalry between Emacs and the other text editor, Via. <laughs> Therefore, people sometimes ask me whether in the Church of Emacs 
the use of VI is a sin. It's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast. <laughs> is not a sin, it's a penance. <laughs> a few years ago I went to China and some VI users made a post on some social media proposing to attack me when I was there. I was shocked, but apparently violence begins with VI. <laughs> People occasionally ask me whether my halo is really an old computer disk. <laughs> this is no computer disk, this is my halo. <laughs> but it was a computer disk in a previous existence. <laughs> Thank you.